Good morning all. Class time is in session. You can follow in real time on the television YouTube channel onespotmedia.com or on gojamaica.com and music99. Today's subjects are CSEC Home Economics for Grade 11, CSEC Agricultural Science for Grade 11 and Cape Caribbean Studies for Grade 13. We begin with Home Economics. I'm Lydia Dunn and the topic is time planning. Let's begin. So this morning, our general objective is at the end of the lesson, students should be aware of the use, importance, need of time planning in order to complete their SBA practical examination. And in order to achieve this general or overall objective, there are some specific objectives that we also need to achieve. We're going to define the term time plan, we're going to identify the parts of the time plan, and we're going to describe the features of each part of the time plan, as well as discuss content required for each part of the time plan. Now, like I said last week, from our objectives, we're going to get our content outline. And I kind of mentioned it before, but just for, to, to ensure that you know what we're doing, I'm going to go through it again. And this is basically what would be your subtopics. So if you're taking notes, you can put topics, subtopics like this in your books. And when we go to our KWL chart, we're going to see how we're going to break it down. So we're going to def the definition of a time plan, we're going to go through the definition of a time plan. We are going to look at the parts of a time plan, the features of each part of the time plan, the content required for each part of the time plan, and of course, we can't end the lesson without creating a time plan. Now, every week I come, when I talk about my KWL chart, I cannot leave this out. When you're studying, you're going to realize how useful this will be to you. Remember, your KWL is what you know, what you want to know, and what you have learned. Your, your topic, of course, you'd fill out your topic time planning, what you already know about time planning, what you want to know about time planning, and what you have learned. And that is when you assess yourself at the end of the lesson. Now, I mentioned earlier in the general objective that your time planning is something that you need in order to complete your practical SBA. But what exactly is your SBA? And what exactly is time planning? So in order to know how we're going to go into time planning, we have to know what our SBA is. And your SBA is one of the profile dimensions assessed by CXC in food, nutrition, and health is practical skills. There are three components. There are three profiles that you're assessed in food, nutrition, and health. As you know, I'm just going to go to, I'm going to tell you all three areas in home economics, family resource management, textile, clothing, and fashion, and food, nu food, nutrition, and health. So though we're focusing on food, nutrition, and health, just want you to know it for all three subject areas under the umbrella of home economics. So profile one means, profile one covers your understanding, your recollection. Profile two covers your application, and profile three covers your practical skills. Now, this means that the student should be able to plan for practical tasks adequately, depending on the task required. CXC normally sends the task. So whatever the task is that you get, you need to plan for it adequately, depending on what is it that they ask you for, or ask you to execute for that matter. You're also going to do practical tasks accurately, efficiently, and efficiently in the allotted time. The allotted time that you are given is two and a half hours. All practical assessments are two and a half hours for food nutrition, for home economics. You're going to use appropriate tools with ease and dexterity. And I want you to also know that these three areas that are given 
this is what is assessed when we are grading you or we are um, assessing your competency in the area. You're going to demonstrate skills in planning, preparing, and serving dishes or food items. Now, right here, this is the one that we're going to be focusing on, planning. The preparing and serving dishes, you'll do in the actual practical classes with your teachers. But it is very good. When you have this underpinning knowledge of how to plan, execution should come quite easily. So there are normally three practical assignments, each testing these practical skills. But for this academic year, you're only going to be tested for two, um, with two practical assignments, or on two practical assignments, rather. So we're going to be looking at planning and preparation skills, manipulation skills, evaluation, and presentation skills. You notice that the first one is planning and preparation skills. You can't evaluate, you cannot present, and you cannot show manipulation unless you plan well. So now that you know what exactly your SBA is, your SBA is a task that is given to you by CXC, and you tend to get those tasks quite early um, in the academic year so that you can plan efficiently and accurately too. So what exactly, how do you go about planning? What exactly is a time plan? A time plan, it is a document or a guide that outlines activities to be done in a practical task within a specific time. Now, a lot of students tend to be unsure as to how they actually go about writing the time plan, um, creating the time plan, using accurate jargons and terminologies for the time plan. So sometimes the time plan tends to be quite wordy and and underworded too, for that matter. So we are, I just want you to know that it's just an outline. It's an outline. It guides you as you are executing your SBA practical. It's a guide. It's a guide. It is a guide. You're not a slave to it. All right? But it is important for you to do it so you know exactly how you're going to allot your two and a half hours that um, is um, given to you. How is it that you're going to execute certain tasks that is being asked of you? Which one you're going to do first? Which one you're going to do last? You know, so that you're not scrambling in the practical um, SBA. So you need, and remember that one of the features I said is that it shows ease and dexterity. You have to show agility. You have to show that you understand what you're doing. And when you understand what you're doing, that's how the easement will come, all right? So let's look at the parts now of the time plan. The time plan has three parts, section A, section B, and section C. Now section A is the section where you choose your dishes according to the task that is required of you. Now, the dishes that you choose or activities chosen as it relates to family resource management, but we're focusing on food and nutrition for now. So the dishes that you will choose according to the task that is given must have the main ingredients with quantities, with quantities. Students tend to not see that word quantities. They just write some list of ingredients. It has to have the quantity. Remember, you are doing the time plan according to a task that is given, a task that is given. And you have to demonstrate understanding of the task. And understanding comes with accurate information. And accuracy must include quantity. Plan B. Plan B shows your plan of work. How is it you're going to allot these two and a half hours? How is it that you're going to actually do this task that is given to you? How is it that you're going to prepare, um, execute this dish? What methods of cooking are you going to employ? And section C is your grocery and special list, um, your special equipment. One of the other main reasons that you, why you need a time, a time plan, it is cost friendly. It, it, a time plan eliminates excessive spending. 
some persons tend to, um, this sounds nice, I'm going to do this. And you know, they kind of go on, on a whim. And it very rarely turns out very well. So the time plan kind of condenses you. It gives you clarity, it gives you accuracy, and it gives you a sure grade one. I promise you that. Now, this is a sample of what, um, I know it's kind of tilted, but I'm going to tell you the website where you can go and access this. So this is the first page of the time plan. The time plan, you see Caribbean Examinations Council, Secondary Education Certificate, Plan Sheet for School-Based Assessment in Home Economics. So this time plan and this sheet is unique to Home Economics. And only two subject areas under the umbrella um, requires a time plan. And that's food, nutrition, and health, and family resource management. On the website, it has a more updated form. So you'll have the name of the candidate, the registration number, the name of the center, the center number, the territory, and the teacher's name. Some persons would say the assessor's name. And then at the bottom, you'll have the question or the task that you have been given. That's where it put at the front. This time plan is to be handed to your assessor at the beginning of the SBA, the practical assignment. Actually, you'll hand it to her before it even begins so that she knows what you're doing. She knows what time you'll be doing a particular dish. So if she has questions that she, she will want to ask you, you know, she knows which time slot she's going to ask it based on what you're executing at that particular time. All right? Now, section A, you try to interpret the question well and clearly outline your answers in the neatest and most accurate way. I mentioned that earlier. And in the most accurate way, they meaning that you give the accurate registration number, accurate center number. The center number is unique to that center. So you cannot say you're at this center, which I will elaborate um, later on in the presentation. You can't say you're at this center and put a completely different center number. It's unique. All right? You, if asked to write a complete meal, apply all the rules of menu planning at, on the front, which is the sheet I showed earlier on, on the time plan. So when you're writing the list of ingredients, avoid opinions. Don't write one large tomato. Instead, write the exact measurement. Remember I said with quantities. So for example, quarter pound or 100 grams. All right. So let's stick a pin right here. While we take this quick break, there's lots more when we return. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching.
Welcome back. Let's continue. So the last thing we left off with, with section A, where we mentioned about um, when you're writing the list of ingredients, you avoid opinions. So let's move on now. And this is what the actual section A time plan sheet would look like. So you have a section over here that says, do not write in this margin for examiner's use only. So when the assessor is actually marking or grading you, this is where they'll put their comments. So you try, you do not write in that section, all right? Section B, this is where you have your plan of work. So you have your setting up. And remember I said before, let me just get all of these up so we can just go through this properly. So we have our setting up in section B. And this French culinary term, mise en place, means putting everything in place, getting everything. So you're setting up your work area. You're having, say for example, you're making six different dishes. You're having your ingredients for your six different dishes on your work counter, on your work area. And you have your cover cloth, you have your trays, everything, and it's neatly assembled before you. You allocate time slots. I recommend, I highly recommend 30-minute slots. When you use your 30-minute slots, it, you have uh, this idea, okay, I have this much time to go, I have this much time to go. And in two and a half hours, that's what? In, for 30 minutes, that's four, four slots, five slots for two and a half hours. So you should have about five slots. But when we go to the actual creation of the time plan today, I'm gonna to show you a little, a little trick that I use where how I break up the half hour slots. Now, you need to bear in mind the length of time needed to cook and or prepare each dish. You need to bear in mind that. For example, if you're gonna be baking something, you're going to be using the method of cooking, baking. And when you bake, Say, for example, the item says you bake for 30 minutes. You know that, and you have to, by the way, I just want to also interject this right here. Within the two and a half hours, the two and a half hours is not just to only prepare your dishes, you know. The two and a half hours includes washing up and pre presentation, garnishing and decoration of all your dishes. So you present it to within the two and a half hours. So please don't think that the two and a half hours is only for actually cooking or baking or whatever other method of cooking you're going to be using. You have to also remember that you're, you must, you must, you must include your washing up, your presentation, garnishing, decoration of all your dishes. So I say all of that to say, when you bear in mind the length of time needed to cook each dish, there are things that you're going to employ when you're doing this. And this is what will show that you understand certain jargons to make your time plan less wordy. So you're going to use dovetailing skills. You're going to use multitasking skills. So the dovetailing is, if you're baking something for 30 minutes, are you going to stand by that oven and one, two, no. You allow it to do its thing and you start another dish. You can multitask. So for example, if you're chopping up um, seasoning or if you're chopping up carrots for uh, an arranged salad or whatever the dish is and you, you're going to use carrot in another dish, just chop up all of the carrot one time now. Just chop up all of it one time, that's multitasking. So you already have that done for two dishes. So you cut time right there. And that is where we are seeing skill and dexterity in how you are executing your time planning. All right? You need to also bear in mind the temperature the dish must be served. I cannot elaborate this anymore. Hot must be served hot and cold must be served cold. When you're writing your time plans, if you know you have something you're, you need to serve cold. So for the task may ask you to serve um, a cold dessert. You do it first. So you know it's in the fridge. So when the time comes to actually present, it's at the temperature in which it is to be served. Likewise for hot dishes. All right? 
So you use cooking methods and jargons to minimize the number of words used to describe tasks. I mentioned this before. I've been saying this before. When you use methods of cooking and jargons, it shows that you have a very good understanding of the theory that has been that has been taught so we're not putting the theory and the practical in isolation everything is integrated in order for you to show competency in the practical skills you must show understanding or you have to execute the understanding in order to manifest competency let's continue Section B continued. Now you're going to include the length of time each dish is to be cooked and the temperatures. I mentioned this before. The mentioned this too. They include the washing up after each 30 minute slot. Now we are preparing you for the industry. Um, Food and nutrition now is aligned to CVQ and NVQJ, all of those things. So that's the Caribbean Vocational Qualification Level 1 in food preparation, commercial food preparation. Some persons may want to actually um, be assessed at that and to show competency and have that Level 1 certification. Some persons may not. Nonetheless, we are teaching from that curriculum we're teaching you for we are preparing you for the industry so we're giving you industry standards and one of the industry standards is cleaning and maintain maintaining um, uh, um hygiene you must execute kitchen and personal hygiene it is a must it is a must it is a must all right foodborne illnesses industries don't play with that all right, so you have to show, you, you start from now, so that when, if you want to go into any one of these industries or even tertiary level to do, um, to continue food and nutrition, culinary arts, anything, you have all of these skills already because you have been training and practicing. And I mentioned the garnishing and decorations of all dishes. This must also be evident in your time plan. And this is what section B would look like. So you have the time here, the order of work, method, oven management, and of course you have that section that you do not write in. Section C. Now section C is your grocery list section. Oops, let me go back to that. All right, so this is where now you're going to kind of look at all the ingredients that you have been using and you're going to write a list of what you need to, to, to get in order to complete the task that has been given. Now this eliminates, like I said before, it eliminates excessive shopping and, um, and, and not buying like in bulk so because you, you have measurements. Remember quantities must be included in section A. So the same will apply to so all our ingredients. So this is basically much mentioned throughout. And this is what section C would look like. So you would kind of um, tabulate. Well, it, we have been tabulating before, but you also compartmentalize your grocery, your shopping list. So we separate the vegetables and the fruits. We separate the groceries and we separate the meat and the fish. All right. We also can put poultry down there. Um, and that's for another time. Meat and poultry, different. Another time. So we'll put that down there as well. And right here, you'll have your special materials, equipment needed. So this is if, for example, if you're going to be making a hot beverage, you need a percolator or an espresso machine, whatever it is, you'd put that here. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to purchase it, but it shows that you understand your skill and what you'll be using to achieve the task that has been given to you. And your time plan sheets, it is online. You can go to cxc.org, to the website here, and on it you'll see site assets, other stuff, and you just click, you'll see the SBA form, plan sheets, HE5, and it's PDF. And you can always YouTube how to convert a PDF to a Word document, and you can just type in it. All right, so let's actually create a time plan now. We are going to now create a time plan based on everything that we just 
learned, everything that we should have now at our disposal. Now remember that first page I talked about where it showed you the subject that you would take. So you now take food and nutrition. And this is the information that you now plug into that section of the top where I said that you're going to give them accurate information. Your name, John Doe, your registration number, I'll soon tell you about that. The name of the center is the school in which you're going to sit the exam and do the actual practical examination where you'll be assessed. And every center has a unique center number to it. It's six digits. And that, would, that can easily be, you can get that easily from your subject teacher or administration um, from your school. Actually, that you should know that from Ford Farm. Your teacher's name or the assessor's name, some persons may have that. Your territory, you are in Jamaica. Now, your registration number is a 10-digit number. That's what you'd get on your timetables, or some you can even access it online once you have registered um, for your examination. You have registered for the subject area. The, it includes the six center number and four additional numbers that is unique to you, the candidate. All right? So it's 10 in all. The four is unique to you, and the six is this, the first six is your center number. And that is how you would complete it. And this is now, at the bottom now, this is where you'll put in the task that has been given to you. Now, I'm deliberately choosing the actual SBA number one task. This is a task that has been given by CXC. And it reads, your Aunt Jessica is finally home from her studies overseas. Plan a welcome home breakfast for her, consisting of the following. A fresh fruit dish, two breakfast proteins, as suitable accompaniments to the item below. And the item below is a batch of quick breads and choice of one hot beverage. And in addition, you are to prepare a milk-based smoothie. So now, in this task alone, you have a lot of topics here. We have fruit, fruit cookery. We have protein, breakfast cookery. We have quick breads. We have hot beverage. And we have milk-based beverages. So this is quite a bit, and all of this would have been covered already by your subject teacher um, before you can actually put everything together and do the SBA. So this was just something that my students and I did together, and I'm going to share with you. So in the activities chosen, they decided, let's go with a tropical bowl. And the tropical bowl, it's one thing I, I should mention, but I'm going to mention it here. The opportunity presents itself now. When you're choosing your ingredients or your dishes, please, as much as possible, choose local produce. It's more nutritious, it's healthier, and above all, it tends to be cheaper. Now, I know some of these beautiful pictures on websites and in cookbooks, they look so nice and you believe wholeheartedly that you can execute it. And I know it's quite ambitious um, for some of you, but you know, start small and then you graduate, all right? And I'm not saying that you can't do it, but practice that at home. And for the actual SBA, let us just employ what is required of us. So let us just now focus on local produce. All right, so our tropical bowl, and we are a tropical island, so fruits is just like in whole to us. So we have pineapples, we have June plum, melon, papa, passion fruit, mango, and oranges. Now, you realize that there are, there are measurements before them, and not only measurements, there are descriptions before them, adjectives, some verbs, um, some would say cubed, segmented. My students wanted triangled papa. They said that they will cut it in there. They wanted different shapes to create a variety, just to make it um, pleasing to the eye because you eat with your eyes before your mouth. It has to be pleasing to you. So they wanted to create this picture and they deliberately put it here. So when now I, as the assessor, take up this time plan, this is exactly what I should see because this is what you say you're going to do. And I should not be seen at no basin of a, a, a tropical bowl. It says a bowl, so it should be in a bowl. And I probably should have mentioned this before too. When you're doing your time plan and you're creating your dishes, 
it should feed a minimum of three persons. Just for SBAs, it should feed a minimum of three persons. So, you, so your presentation should be in platters and protein dish and because you are going to decorate and garnish all of them and you're going to have a presentation area. Your teacher will elaborate on that for you. All right, because we're focusing on the time plan. And here are the equipment needed below. We have our paring knives, a fruit baller, cookie cutters, and bowls. And I don't, I did not, we did not list every single thing we're going to use because there's one word here that did not ask for it. It said main, main, main. So if you have like a dash of salt, a little bit of this, you don't need to add that to it. All right? It just asks for the main. And we continue with, this is one of the protein dishes. Now, sunny side up eggs. And the reason why I, we decided to use sunny side up eggs, because when you look at breakfast cookery, eggs tend to come out in it. And so we kind of have egg cookery. And most of my students, unfortunately, they are not quite familiar with sunny side up eggs. So I don't really want to, I don't want them to actually prepare even though it is egg i don't want them to make it the same way that they are accustomed to making it i want them to, to i want diversification in the food i want to see the actual skill of egg cookery being utilized in the sba trust me your assessor it will wow your assessor that you actually know what you're doing and that proves competence all right so like i said it serves three so we have three whole eggs and the rest is there. Just, it's, so it's similar to up top. Once you catch a pattern, you just mention the main ingredients. So this, the sunny side egg is just a repeat. So let's now look at this. Stewed sausage with baked beans. Now my students, they wanted this. They said, miss, we, we love sausage and baked bean. But I said, but you can't call it sausage and baked bean on the time plan. It has to have a method of cooking. You must have a method of cooking. I don't know how much more I need to stress that you must have a method of cooking. So even if you want stewed chicken or chicken, and, you can't just write chicken cook up chicken, that's not a method of cooking. So we want to kind of go away from our dialect and, our, and, our, and, our, and the, the, the patois and employ the terminologies, the correct cooking methods and jargons within the subject area, all right? And that's how you kind of get that practice and, 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 and familiarity with these words, read. Just read a textbook, you hear? That's why, well, that's why you have it, just read, all right? And sometimes you can talk, like, use the jargons in your everyday communication, even with your parents, even if they don't fully understand, still say it because you know. And who knows, that's a teaching moment that you can have with your family. So right here, just the same. You realize that we're sticking to the pattern with the, the, the quantities, the description, how we're going to actually have it. It's going to be sliced. It's going to be cubed. Whatever it is, it's going to be diced. And then we have it here. Now, I just added this here, salt and pepper to taste, just for my students' benefit. But it doesn't have to be there. All right? And here are the main equipment, just the same, that um, has been listed. Now we're coming down with, they wanted to do waffles as a quick bread. Remember that the question asks for um, a batch of quick breads, and they wanted to do waffles because they have never really seen waffles before. And that's fine, or they never really... They don't really eat waffles, so it's not a common thing to them. So, so you can use the same pancake butter. So if you have a pancake recipe, a pancake butter recipe, you just add a little less water and you can make waffles. But waffles really can only be made on a waffle iron or a waffle maker. That's what makes it a waffle with the, with the shape of it. So if you don't have that, then you just probably have to stick to pancakes. Now, the quick breads tend to normally cook at high temperatures, and the, the method of preparing is fairly quick. That's why it's a quick bread. So you don't handle the dough as, oft, as, as much as you would uh, a, a cake batter. So it's a very quick um, putting together preparation and high temperature quick baking. So other quick breads can include Johnny cake, fried dumpling that we are used to, muffins, savory muffins. And I just wanted to know, you see some of the muffins that we eat, they might look too sweet. Muffins really ought not to be sweet. Muffins is more on the savory side. All right? So just want to let you know that because I know some persons listening when say, muffin, no, but me eat that for dessert. No. 
It's supposed to be on more on the savory side and it's to be had with a protein. Or you can even have it with um, a cup of coffee. So, but that's for another time. Let's move on. So it's a milk-based smoothie. My students, they wanted pumpkin smoothie because they said their father cook it and it tastes nice. And this is the recipe that they gave me. It's a milk-based, so you have to include milk. You must include milk. It don't have to be whole milk. You can use soy milk if you're allergic or you're lactose intolerant. You can use coconut milk because the question didn't specify the type of milk. It just said milk-based. All right? You can use evaporated milk and you kind of get the gift. All right, let's go to the plan of work now. So the plan of work that we have here, and this is the trick I wanted to, to kind of share with you. I break up mine at the first time that is there and the last time that is there. I split the half hour into 50, I split it in two. So I have 15 minutes there in between. So I start with my 15 minutes and the only thing you need to write on your time plan is mise en place. That's all you need to write. That means getting everything in place, putting everything in its place. This is self-explanatory for the first 15 minutes. And then you actually go, you begin your time slots now of your 30 minutes. And you can actually indicate what exactly you're going to prepare. So we're going to start with our tropical bowl because our tropical bowl should be served chilled not room temperature. So when we do this, we're going to put it in the refrigerator. We put it to chill. And that should be mentioned in the time in this area. This is mentioned so that we the examiner knows, oh, so it should be cold. It should be um, not room temperature, you know? So all of that is mentioned here. And you realize it's not so worded. So right here, you don't need to say, I'm going to use a knife now, cut triangles. No, cut all fruits in desired shapes. So English language going to play out a lot here, all right? So you're going to have to use words, use your thesaurus as best as possible and stuff like that. And it goes on the same. The pumpkin punch can be done here because you want it cold. You can even switch the place with the pumpkin punch and the tropical fruit, you know. So you could switch it here. And you kind of get the understanding here. So you go whatever you can do within your five-minute slots, your 30-minute slot here. Same here. And I just want you to see that we're actually covering everything. Prepare the sunny side up egg. We do the coffee last because we need it to serve hot. And then at the last, the last 15 minutes, garnish and present all dishes. You call your examiner. All right? This is it for your list of ingredients. You just pull everything together and you realize you have it there. Just pull out, just basically add up everything that you're using. And there you have it. And that's it. We have covered what is a time plan, parts of the time plan, features of each part of the time plan, and the content required for each time plan. And, the, and we have just created our own time plan. All right? You're now going to complete your KWL chart and fill out what it is that you have learned. All right? Thank you so much again. And we, and that is it for today's session on time planning. We break now for some housekeeping matters after which class time continues with CSEC Agricultural Science. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching.
It's here. Interactive classes for all ages on the School Time channel on OneSpotMedia.com. With a combination of live Zoom classes and recorded class time, schools not out lessons, and numerous educational content, we've created a comprehensive 24-hour channel dedicated exclusively to educating our nation's youth. Early childhood through to primary, secondary and tertiary, it's one stop on one spot for education, 24 hours. Brought to you by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information in association with Television Jamaica Limited. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on OneSpotMedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching. Welcome back, this is Agriculture Science, and I'm your instructor, Janet White Taylor, and we'll be looking at pests and diseases of farm animals. Let's begin. So, today, students, we are going to look at the pests and diseases of farm animals that affect our animals in the Caribbean. And as we move on, these are the objectives we want to achieve today. One, describe the general signs of illness in farm animals. Two, identify the cause, clinical signs, prevention and control of pests and diseases of poultry and rabbits. Three, identify the cause, clinical signs, prevention and control of pests and diseases of livestock. And four, understand good agricultural practices to avoid the major pests and diseases that affect livestock. And finally, we want to be able to implement control measures for various pests and diseases. Let us now look at a definition for pest. A pest is a destructive insect or animal that attacks crops, food, and livestock and is harmful to humans or human concerns. So a very important pest in agriculture is rats. 
Next definition, we want to look at disease. A disease is a disorder or any condition which makes the animal not normal and less productive. In order for us to address disease problems, we have to pay attention to correct feeding, good sanitation, good nutrition as well, and to make sure that all the practices that we are carrying out, we are carrying them out correctly so as to discourage diseases. So as agricultural practitioners, students and farmers out there, when you go to look at your animals, we have to be able to identify or to see if our animals are healthy or not. How would we know if the animals that we are raising are healthy? The animals are going to be alert and responsive to environmental stimuli. The eyes of the animals are going to be bright with no mucus on the sides or the eyelids. And in Jamaica, we would refer to that as matter eyes. We don't want the animal eyes to look like that. Because, and if the animal is healthy too, the animal will also watch you. The animal will have a cold, wet nose. The coat is smooth with a sheen. And the appetite is going to be very good if the animal is healthy. So we have here on screen the picture of two animals. We have a poultry right here, Leo. The, the eyes of this animal is bright and alert. The animal is watching you. And then the next picture, we have a dog, very bright and alert, because when animals are healthy, they are going to watch you. Good? Another thing we want to look at are examples of coats of healthy animals. If the animals are healthy students, the coat is going to be smooth. It's not going to be looking ruffled. And as you can see, we have a dairy cattle there, very, very smooth. And then we have the Barbados black belly sheep, and we are seeing that the coat has a shiny sheen as well. These appearances are appearances of healthy animals. Other characteristics as we move on, the animal is going to produce relatively firm feces without straining. And so when you walk inside your poultry house, for example, students, you need to observe and observe and observe. You're looking at the animals, looking into their eyes. You're looking at their stance. Are they moving around or are they limping? You're also examining their feces to make sure that the animals are healthy. So as I said students are on duty over the weekend and students did not turn up. I will know when I enter the, the fall pen because the first thing that I'm going to examine is the feces of the animals. And if the feces are looking green in color, then I know that somebody did not do their duty. So these observations that we carry out, it's very, very important for us to ensure that our animals remain healthy. If the animal is healthy students, the animal is going to bleed, grunts or moves normally and does not sound distressed does not limp when walking and mixes with the flock or herd and is not isolated. So if you enter your house and you're seeing that the animal is all by himself or herself, you know that something is wrong with that animal. Animals like to lime and to mix with each other. Good? If the animal is healthy too, the animal will have what we call a normal stance. This means that the animal is going to stand, yes? And the animal too will have what we call a normal rectal temperature of its class. So for poultry, you're going to have 41 degrees Celsius. For goats and sheep, 39.4 degrees Celsius. For pigs, 39.2 degrees Celsius. And for cattle, 38.6 degrees Celsius. So just for us to, just to go back to recap what a healthy animal will look like. You're seeing this dairy cattle right here. Good stance, yes. The coat of the animal, you're seeing the sheen and the animal is very alert. The animal is watching you. And of course, the animal will be able to consume the feed as well. So it's very important as you move around in your community, you're looking at the animals that you're seeing and you can come to a conclusion based on what you're seeing on the outward appearance, you can say yes. The animals that I'm seeing, they are healthy animals. Good? Let us now move on to look at characteristics of unhealthy animals. If the animal is not healthy students, you're going to see the eyes looking watery with mucus coming from the sides and eyelids. It is an indication that the animal is not well. 
The court is going to be dull and ruffled with swellings or lesions on the skin. The animal will have a poor appetite and then becomes listless. That means low in energy. And the urine is going to be discolored. It could be reddish or greenish in color. The animal too will be what we call constipated, having difficulty in passing their feces, or they'll be having scoring. That means they'll have a loose stool or diarrhea. The animal too, if the if it's animal is unhealthy, will be shivering or groaning in pain. So we are looking to what we talk about alertness. If the animal is not healthy, the animal is going to lack alertness and fails to respond quickly to environmental stimuli as seen in this picture here. The animal will want to look like it wants to sleep all the time, looking sleepy and have no energy at all to move around. Other characteristics, the animal will show signs of fever, that is high rectal temperature. Good, and in poultry, signs of ill health is going to include loss of appetite and also respiratory problems. You may walk inside your pen and you're going to hear the animals coughing and wheezing, and then you know that something is wrong with your chickens that you have inside your house. So observations inside your pen students, and I must repeat it, it's very, very important because when you're able to tell if your animals are healthy or unhealthy, then it means that you're a good manager and you'll be able to manage your business in such a way that you'll be able to make a profit when it's time for you to slaughter your animals or if you're dealing with picking up your eggs and so on. Good? So just to give you an example, by looking at this picture right here, um, on my left, you're seeing the animals they're feeding. The coat is looking dull and ruffled, yes? And you're seeing the next animal with what we call skin legions. This is an indication, too, that these animals are not healthy at all. Good? So not just... You, it's not just to say that boy, you're looking for certain things. You're able now, based on what you're seeing now, you can see based on the coat what is happening with the health of your animals. So just to continue by looking at other characteristics of unhealthy animals, the animal is going to walk slowly with discomfort, or it's going to want to lie down for long periods. It's going to lack energy to stand up. General dullness and droopiness, the ears will not be what we call very alert or responsive, drooping ears, coughing, sneezing, noisy breathing sounds, and the animal too will be isolated from the flock or herd, being unable to keep up, especially when they are grazing or walking. So just to give you an example of what an unhealthy animal look like, the animal is lying down for long periods, unable to get up. The animal is just looking droopy all the time because healthy animals will have a good stance, yes? And this is very, very important. So what we have looked at so far, students, we have looked at the characteristics of healthy animals and some characteristics, too, of unhealthy animals. We need to bear these things in mind because it is important as we continue to manage the livestock and the poultry and rabbits that we are raising. We now want to continue by looking at the pests and diseases of poultry. And so we want to look at four diseases today in terms of pests and diseases. We want to look at the Newcastle disease. We want to look at coccidiosis. We want to look at Marek's disease. And we also want to look at the flu as well, the avian influenza. Let us now look at the Newcastle disease. And once we start to look at diseases, students, you must know what caused that disease, what are the symptoms, and how we can prevent or control that disease. So that is what we want to zero in on in this, in this um, section of the presentation. So for Newcastle disease, the symptoms that you're going to be able to see, the chickens are going to have loss of appetite, droopiness, nasal mucus discharge, twitching of head and neck, breathing difficulties, paralysis and sudden death, mortality rate is high. Prevention and control, there is no treatment for infected birds. Young chicks should be vaccinated, adopt sanitary measures by using a foot bath, cleaning and disinfecting poultry pens 
feeders and waterers. And remember students, dead birds should be buried or burned because we want to ensure that we are not going to pass on the disease to the rest of the flock. So we need to remove them and then we need to bury them or burn them. If we are going to bury animals that come down with diseases, we need to bury them far from the water source because we do not want to contaminate the water sources that we have on our farms. Good? Let us move on now to look at fall pox disease and it's caused by a virus. So while we as humans have chicken pox, the chickens are going to have what we call fall pox disease. What are the symptoms, students? You're going to see warts, legions, or blisters on the comb, wattle, eyelids, face, and legs. And the mortality rate is low to moderate. Prevention and control, there's no treatment for infected birds. But young birds should be vaccinated and all infected birds should be isolated and carcass carcasses should be buried or burned. Let's move on to look at picture of the fall pox showing the warts on the comb of that chicken right there. And you're also seeing warts over the eyelids as well. That is when the chickens come down with the fall pox disease. So it's very, very evident. Sometimes you can see those legions on the legs as well. So you're able to see, and then we know that we need to isolate these chickens. Good? Next disease we want to look at is the Marek's disease, and it is caused by a herpes virus. And so we need to know the symptoms, prevention, and control. Sometimes when we purchase our chickens from the farm store, as soon as we get them, as young as we get them, we are able to see in those in that batch of chickens that we raise, maybe one, two, or three that have signs of the Marek's disease. So we want to look at so that you students at school, you'll be able to identify what are some of the symptoms if your chickens inside your house have the Marek's disease. Good? So you're going to have what we call twisting of the head and the neck, droopy wings, loss of weight because these chickens will not be able to develop as fast as the other chickens. The other chickens are moving up, you're raising your waterers and your feeders, and these animals will not be able to get there to eat, so you really have to isolate them. The gray color of the iris, then you're going to have paralysis of these chickens followed by death. And disease can take several forms, and, and the mortality rate is high. Prevention and control, there is no treatment for infected birds. Day old chicks should be vaccinated. And remember students, strict hygiene should be followed. Isolate infected birds and burn or bury the carcasses. However, there are resistance strains now available so that we can ensure that when we purchase our chickens from the farm store, we are getting good quality or chickens that have what we call the, the um, strains that they will not come down with the Marek's disease. Good? So, so far we have looked at fall pox. We have looked at Newcastle disease. We have just looked at Marek's in terms of poultry production. We want to move on now. And you're looking at a picture of the Marek's disease. And this is just one of the symptoms. You're seeing where the chicken have what we call outstretched legs. These legs can't bend at all one forward and one backward. Sometimes the neck is twist in a very uncomfortable position and it's difficult for these chickens to really survive and to be productive in the flock. Moving on, we want to look at next disease. This is very, very important, especially here in our region, and that is coccidiosis. And this disease is caused by a protozoan. Good? Now, it's very important for us to carry out observations because if we are not observing things inside our house, simple things will miss us, and especially coccidiosis. And so I want to go on now to look at the symptoms of coccidiosis. Good? The animal is going to become droopy, loss of appetite. There's going to be diarrhea with blood in the feces or streaks of blood. So that is why you have to make sure that you look, take the observation Take it seriously when you go inside the house. Don't just rush inside your house and then just feed and get out. 
you have to make sure that you're observing everything. The vent or cloak of the chicken is going to become swollen and bloody and look kind of messy too. There's going to be thriftlessness, then finally death. However, the mortality rate is moderate. So students, if you go inside your house tomorrow and you're seeing signs of the coccidiosis disease, don't panic. If your chickens are, let us say, at four weeks, you're looking, you're weighing them to make sure that you can take them out at five weeks. You don't want to take them into six weeks because they may not start to die yet. But if you decide to keep them longer, they'll just start to just drop inside the house and die. So what you need to do, find out from your market what is the weight they required, and you need to slaughter those chickens as quickly as possible. Coccidiosis is not passed on to human beings, so it is okay to consume this meat. So those are the things we need to pay attention to as managers. So you're not going to go in and I said, I asked the question, students, so we have coccidiosis in this house, what are we going to do? You're going to say, kill them and bury them. No, we want to at least give them a few more days or another week, and then we slaughter them so that we are able to make money. We are not going to make the profit we should make because the animal weight now will not be as it should be because of the problem with this disease. Prevention and control, treat with sulfur jugs and magnesium sulfate in the drinking water. Birds should be removed from wet infected litter and students, once you walk inside your house and the litter is wet, remove it and replace with dry litter. Good? And stocking density should be reduced and you could practice good sanitation. Also students, if you are able to recognize the chickens based on the swollen vent, then you can also isolate those chickens. So for example, at four and five weeks, we have to be careful too in terms of treating them with drugs because we don't want to give them medication and then we slaughter soon after. Because if we practice that, then the medication is not going to be in the meat of the chicken. And we as humans, we do not want to consume that. So I'll say at four weeks, we're not treating. We want to get them to five weeks, slaughter them and get them out of the house. So these are the things in terms of being a manager. And once we become agricultural practitioners, we are managers and we need to know how to manage. And so you don't need to ball and say, boy, you don't know what to do and what you're going to do. You're just going to be calm and to manage because at the end of the day, we are in agriculture to make a profit because farmers must have good income that they can live good lifestyles. Good? So this is just showing you a picture of an animal, a chicken with coccidiosis, with looking at thriftlessness, and you're seeing there bloody droppings right there. And if you, if you could see the vent, it's looking very untidy and swollen because this chicken have the coccidiosis. We want to move on to look at the next disease in chickens, bird flu, or what we call avian influenza, and this is caused by a virus. Now, we need to pay attention to this one because this disease is what we call um, a notifiable disease. And so what you're going to see, the symptoms, if your chickens come down with the bird flu, swelling of the head, blue coloration of the comb and wattles, loss of appetite, the chicken is going to have breathing problems and diarrhea. And if there are layers, you're going to have drop in egg production and then sudden death. Treatment and control, there is no cure, but good nutrition and sanitation is going to be key. And you want to give them antibiotics as well because this may alleviate the symptoms. Vaccination is not normally recommended as vaccinated birds may remain carriers and infected birds should be isolated. And I say students all the time when you're raising chickens, always or any animal at all that you're raising at home or on the farm, always practice good sanitation measures. This is key. If you want your animals to be productive and to do well, make sure that the environment is clean. Wash the waterers, wash the feeders, yes? Get the bedding out and all of those things. That's very, very important. If outbreak occurs, then what we need to do, slaughter the birds, bury them, or we can burn the carcasses. So 
these things are very, very important as we move forward. And as you're doing your SBAs right now, you also need to pay attention because we have to ensure that sanitation is done right throughout the system. Good? We now want to move on now to look at pests and diseases of rabbits because rabbits are also important in the Caribbean as well. And rabbits too, like poultry, they come down with what we call coccidiosis disease. And so we just want to look today at two for rabbits. So we're going to start by looking at snuffles. What are the symptoms for snuffles and what causes this disease? It is caused by a bacterial infection. The symptoms, you're going to be seeing nasal discharge of mucus. The rabbits are going to be sneezing rubbing off nose and eyes with four paws. Treatment and control. You can treat the animals, the infected animals, with sulfur drugs and antibiotics. Infected animals, we need to isolate them. You want to give them, feed, or feed them a nutritious diet and adopt good sanitary measures. Also in your breeding program, do not breed the infected rabbits, even if Recovery occurs, the animals may still be carriers, and you do not want animals with carriers of disease in your breeding program at all, right? Let's move on to look at a pest that affects rabbits. And then we have the mange caused by a parasitic mite. And other animals too will come down with mange, even pigs. So if you walk, for example, inside your pen and you see like the animal is rubbing up against the wall and scratching and scratching and scratching, you know that the animal is having mange and you're looking and the air is falling out and it's looking red and inflamed. That is also a symptom of mange. In rabbits, you're going, symptoms are going to be having head shaking, itching and scratching, then a thick crust of mites accumulating inside the air. Loss of fur, and then you're going to have the sores as well. Treatment and control, you want to massage minerals into the air, mineral oils, and then you want to clean the infected area with an antiseptic solution. You could also apply lime or sulfur ointment, and as usual and as we say again, so for all of these diseases, we can safely say adopt strict sanitary measures, and you want to clean and disinfect the rabbit tree. That's very, very important. So what we have done so far, students, we have looked at pests and diseases affecting rabbits and chickens. And students, when, you're raised, when you have your farm, do not put chickens and rabbits on the same building. Because as I said before, both of them are affected by coccidiosis. So these things are very important. Let us move now to look at some revision questions. Question one. Young chicks were vaccinated to prevent disease infection. The likely disease the chicks were vaccinated against was A, snuffles, B, coccidiosis, C, Newcastle, and D, scaly legs. And so the answer, and I know that you have it right, the answer is C, the Newcastle disease. Good. Moving on to the next question. A goat shows the symptoms, low body temperature, inclination to lie down, soft and highly scented stool. The goat is most likely suffering from A, coccidiosis, B, bloat, C, pneumonia, D, scours. And so the answer is D, scours. And so we have two types of scour students. We have what we call nutritional scours, and then we have white scours. The difference is that nutritional scours do not have what we call, it is not highly scented, but the white scours is going to be highly scented. So the answer for that question is D, scours. Next question, which of the following is not likely a nutritional disorder in cows? A, shortage of quality protein, B, deficiency of cobalt, C, excess of trace element copper, and D, excess fluid in the gut. And I know that you're coming along, and so the answer for this question is D, excess fluid in the gut. Good? 
So we are moving on now, students, to look at pests and diseases of livestock. And we want to pay attention to a term we call notifiable diseases. Now, once you see that, it is telling you that the disease is very serious and special precautions are necessary because either the disease is likely to spread very quickly to infect nations, entire livestock population, and an example of a notifiable disease is foot and mouth disease. Or the disease presents threat to the health of the human population, such as anthrax and rabies. So we want to always pay attention to this term. Once you see I put in terms of disease and I put notifiable disease, you need to realize that this disease could be a threat either to the nation's livestock or to our health. Good? So we're now going to move in to look at summary of important cattle diseases in the Caribbean. Also students, some of these diseases are not only um, affecting cattle, but they're also affecting goats and sheep as well. So we want now to look at the name of the disease, the causative agents, the main symptoms, and the control methods. We're going to start by looking at rabies. It's caused by a virus, main symptoms, paralysis, and we can use in terms of control methods, preventative vaccine, it is a notifiable disease. Good? Next, foot and mouth disease caused by a virus. And you're going to be seeing blisters on the feet and salivation. You could also have the blisters on the mouth as well. The animal is going to be very difficult for the animal to consume their food. So they are going to lose weight. Preventative vaccine in terms of control method. It is also a notifiable disease. Mastitis. This disease is caused by bacteria where you're going to have the main symptoms, sore odor, flaky milk, and it, the, the animals sometimes will come down with a fever, and you can see that they are in pain. Control methods, sanitation, and antibiotics. Foot rot, caused by a bacteria, is main symptoms, lameness, and in terms of control methods, we want to avoid wet conditions, we want to have good foot care out there, and you can give the animals chemical foot bath. It's very, very important, as I said before, to observe the animals, yes? Sometimes you have to take those that have their hoofs, and you have to trim them. You want to make sure that your animals are doing well. That is why, too, we tend to put what we call, like, our goats and so on, on slatted floor. You want to ensure that they are not staying in wet conditions for long, because you don't want them to come down with foot rot, good? Not, you don't want that at all, because that is going to limit the amount of money that you're going to make and the productivity of the animal. And once you're investing money into any project at all, you want to make sure that you benefit from the project. And this is very, very important. Good? We want to continue by looking at some other diseases in our region. The next one is ringworm and it is caused by a fungus. You're gonna be seeing in terms of symptoms, ring-like patches on skin, and control methods, we can use gentian violet. Next disease, which is very important, especially for cattle, is the anaplasmosis, rickettsia, rickettsia and, and it is transmitted by ticks. What are the symptoms? Fever and progressive anemia. And control methods, you want to use tick control and antibiotics in the early stage. So when we talk about tick control, we can either what we call spray the animals or pass them through a dip. Now, once the animal comes down with the tick fever, you have to be very, very careful because the animal is losing blood. They are going to become very, very weak and it's going to affect their productivity. And you know that in Jamaica, once you're raising cattle out there, if you're going to those pastures, you're going to be seeing tick. But we want to ensure that your, your animals, they are always protected at all times so that they'll never develop this condition called anaplasmosis. Good? Next disease, we call that heart water. Causative agent, rickettsia, it is transmitted by ticks as well. 
What are the main symptoms? We are going to be seeing the animal will come down with a high fever, muscle twitching. The cattle then is going to be walking in circles, looking confused too because of this, this, this disease that we call heart water. It also affects goats and sheep as well. Control methods, you want to be able to eliminate the ticks. You want to look so that you can have treatment very, very early and you want to treat them with the appropriate and prescribed antibiotics. Good? We now want to move on to look at important parasites of cattle. And parasites, they want to live off other animals. So these cattle now become a host. And so we have to pay attention because we have two types of parasite students. We have external parasites and we also have internal parasites. And so the parasites of importance, we have looked at them already in terms of looking at anaplasmosis and heart water. It's caused by the parasite, the ticks. It's an external parasite. What are the symptoms or what we call damage to the host? The tick is going to suck the blood of the animal. The animal is going to become anemic. And if there's any open wound, and there will be open wound from these bites from the ticks, it's going to cause some infection. It's going to affect the quality of the skin. Because you know in Jamaica that we eat in the cow skin, right? We eat in the pig skin because these things are very important. So you don't want to affect the quality of the skin. You want when persons go to buy these things, they are getting good quality. Good? And ticks also transmit many other diseases. You have like the tick fever, the heart water, and the red water as well. Good? What is the control? You want to have chemical treatment of dips and also spraying the animals. Students, please note, when you're going to spray the animals, do not spray that chemical solution into the eyes of the animals. You want to always protect the eyes. Good? Next important one is what we call roundworms. And these are internal parasites, damage to host, they're going to have scoring or diarrhea, anemia and poor productivity. Control, clean pastures and using deworming medicine. Good? We now want to move on. We have just covered important diseases and parasites of cattle. And some of these diseases affect goat and sheep as well. We are moving on now to look at important diseases in pigs in the Caribbean. And the first one we want to look at is of cholera. Good? And it's caused by a virus. What are the main symptoms, students? Very high fever, loss of appetite, redden spots on the skin, severe diarrhea. The animals will also faint. faint. They'll be trembling. They'll go into a coma and finally death. There's no known cure, but we can give them vaccination at three months of age, and this is a notifiable disease because this disease, it could affect the entire nation's herd as well as also affect human as well. So we have to pay close attention when we are raising our pigs. Next disease, the sentry, and it's caused by a bacteria. You're going to have severe diarrhea. Once animals come down with the diarrhea students, it's going to affect their productivity. Good? But in this diarrhea, we're going to see presence of blood in the feces, and the animal is going to become dehydrated. Control methods, antibiotics, and good sanitation measures must be practiced. Let us look at this revision question, because we have been going through quite a lot. Yes? One week after purchasing the pigs, Farmer K notices that the urine of one of the sows is bloodstained. The veterinarian recommends that this pig be treated with antibiotics. Farmer K follows all the instructions for treating the pig, but the pig does not respond. Question, suggest with a reason why the prescribed antibiotics is not effective in treating this condition. So we are saying they just bought the pigs. So we are getting pigs from outside. They are coming inside, right? He's noticing that there is what we call bloodstained urine. And he's doing what the veterinarian is saying. He's treated with antibiotics. But there's nothing is changing. 
and suggest a reason, what we now need to do is to ensure that the condition, the environment is very clean. We can move that animal into isolation because we're not sure what is happening there because we want the animal to recover. When you put animals in isolation, they are able now to rest and to recover. And so with the antibiotics and isolation, we should be able to see some changes in the animal. Good. Next, advise Farmer K of one management practices she can adopt to prevent the spread of this disease on her farm. And I'd want to tell Farmer K to practice what we call, you're getting animals from somewhere else, you want to put them in quarantine first, at least two weeks to ensure that they are well, because you don't want them to come into your flock and give your, I mean, to give your, your livestock there any disease at all. So I'm saying that we could either isolate them first or we can put them in quarantine, good? Let's move on now to look at scours, and this is more common in piglets, but it is also common in other livestock as well. You can have scours in rabbits, in sheep, goats, yes? and cattle as well. Let us now look at nutritional scores. Can be caused by overfeeding and unsanitary conditions. The animals produce watery feces with no offensive smell, and you can treat the animal by giving them cod liver oil, mineral oil, or baking soda. And there we need to practice what we call good agricultural practices to avoid pests and diseases of our livestock. The house must be clean and sanitized. Clean the feeders and waterers. Move what we call waste out of the house. Provide good nutritious feed for them. Deworm them regularly. Have your foot bath at the entrance of your house. These things are very, very important. So by definition, we are looking at isolation. We said once the animal is suspected to have a contagious infection, remove them and put them in isolation. And we're using these words now more often now because of COVID-19. Quarantine, we want to protect the animals that are on our farm, so we need to quarantine, place them in a separate area for at least two weeks until we are sure that they're not carrying out any disease. Good? If you're going to put them in isolation, make sure that the area is from all other animals and you're paying attention to what we call good sanitation practices and make sure that you have your foot bath. Yes? And so as well, students, these are just examples of foot bath. You're seeing the cats there walking through a foot bath, going into the dairy area, and persons or visitors entering your farm, you want them to have put their boots in the foot bath, that they'll take nothing from outside, inside, and nothing from inside, outside. Biosecurity measures, students, very, very important. You want to make sure that any vehicle or persons coming in, you're passing them through the foot bath to ensure that you're protecting your animals as well. So students, so glad you could join us for class today. I want to tell you that continue to do your best. We have come to the end of the presentation. Thank you for joining me for CSEC Agricultural Science. Cape Caribbean Studies is after the break. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching.
It's here. Interactive classes for all ages on the School Time channel on OneSpotMedia.com. With a combination of live Zoom classes and recorded class time, schools not out lessons, and numerous educational content, we've created a comprehensive 24-hour channel dedicated exclusively to educating our nation's youth. Early childhood through to primary, secondary and tertiary, it's one stop on one spot for education, 24 hours. Brought to you by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Information in association with Television Jamaica Limited. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on OneSpotMedia.com, click here. Thank you very much for watching. When we talk about hazards, we're talking about those very specific things that have the potential to cause a disaster, such as a hurricane or earthquake or a volcanic eruption, right? So those are hazards. Now, the disaster is the destructive result because you can, in fact, have um, hazards and they don't necessarily destructively affect an area. So there's no disaster, right so you you want to ensure that you are using the terminology correctly as you write your essay so we're focusing on that particular essay as we go through now if you're doing this essay you still need to know so while you're focusing on the mitigation strategies you still need to know something about the various kinds of hazards that are there and that's precisely what we're going to do now and you want to give a general understanding of this in your introduction before you go on to giving your thesis statement, which will then 
focus directly on the mitigation strategies. And we're coming to that. So the geology of the Caribbean, let us remind ourselves of that. We looked at this before when we were locating and defining the Caribbean. All right, so we talked about plate tectonics and we talked about tectonic activities and seismic activities that affect the Caribbean. And we said that the Caribbean plate is the central defining feature when we're talking about these things in the Caribbean. Volcanoes, earthquakes, mountain building, tsunamis come under all of that. All right, so this is the Caribbean plate. We're reminding ourselves of what it looks like and the area that it covers, all right? And we're going to focus on this area very specifically as when we talk about uh, margin, plate margins and so on. All right, so here's another view of it that could help us to get a better uh, picture of it. And we're noticing that the Caribbean plate borders North American plate, South American plate, Cocos plate, Nazca plate, and so on. All right, so we're just reminding ourselves of those things. So let's look at earthquakes just very generally now. These are caused by a sudden release of slowly accumulated strain energy along a fault, along a fault in the Earth's crust. So the earthquakes and volcanoes occur, occur most commonly at the collision zone between tectonic plates. And plates can either be convergent, which means that they are moving towards each other, divergent, which means that they're moving away from, or transform, they're moving alongside each other. And we find that with the Caribbean situation, we do have more of a convergent and transform situation than we have divergent along the Caribbean area. So earthquakes represent a particularly severe threat due to the irregular timing and intervals between them, and you really don't know. There's no real prediction of earthquakes, even though based on where places are located and the fault lines that are known and the plates and so on and the plate movements, there are attempts to, to actually make people aware that earthquakes could be happening. So there are monitoring systems that are in place, but you really cannot time an earthquake down like that all right so here is a picture of how when a when an earthquake occurs and there are cracks on the surface all right so this is what it looks like volcanoes now these are perforations in the earth's crust and we just saw a video that shows us directly how volcanoes occur how they happen and the, the hazards that are associated or the disaster that may come as a result are falling ash, projectiles, mud flows, toxic gases, and so on. And volcanic activity may also trigger other uh, hazardous events, including tsunamis. Now, those, it is said that the, the idea of a tsunami is actually not so common in the Caribbean and not much likely, but it could still happen. All right? So, obviously, we know what, what erupting volcanoes would, would look like. Now, let's look at some very specific volcanoes in the Caribbean. All right, so we have a transform plate margin in the Greater Antilles, but only extinct volcanoes are said to be along this area or dormant um, volcanoes. So we don't have much activity in the Greater Antilles area. But there is a convergent plate margin along the Lesser Antilles, and this gives rise to a number of um, volcanoes along a certain path, all right? So we have Martinique, and that one is called Mount Pelé, and that erupted in 1902. Montserrat, which is very, very, very active. Sufrer Hills erupted in 1995, and then 2003, and the en one, an entire section of the island, including the capital, Plymouth, had to be evacuated, and nobody lives there because of the activities that took place there. And that volcano is a very, very active one. And then we have St. Vincent, Mount Sufrer, 
which is that also erupted 1902. And I think that this one gave rise to Mount Pelee. And then you have off the coast of Grenada, not quite on the island, off the coast, a submarine volcano that is called Kikem Jenny. You may have heard of this particular one. All right, so this is the area we're talking about here, over this side right here. And if you notice, when we saw where the plate margin, the Caribbean plate margin is, it, it's right outside of the area here, this archipelago that is the Lesser Antilles. And so you do have a number, uh, I think the number is about 17 active volcanoes in that area alone. So the Lesser Antilles, very, very active when it comes on to volcanoes, but not so active in the Greater Antilles. All right, so tsunamis, as we said, these are long period waves, very high waves that are generated whenever there is a, a, a kind of severe movement of either earthquakes or volcanic activity. And we do not necessarily have much examples of tsunamis occurring in the Caribbean, but we do know that parts of Asia and that ring of fire area, they have a very high possibility of um, tsunamis taking place. That doesn't mean that we should not be on high alert. So there we have it, these high waves. We don't have these in the Caribbean, mainly the ones we have are for surfing, right? And we enjoy those. Now, hurricanes, this is the one we are very, very familiar with because we, the Caribbean area is directly along the path that hurricanes normally take. And hurricanes are formed off the coast of Africa, West Africa, and they travel into the Caribbean area. And so we are very, very familiar with this. We have a long hurricane period. Do you know the hurricane period? You should know because we're always on high alert at this time. Lots of media attention and so on. All right, so these are tropical into severe storms and there is a process. They begin as a wave, then a depression, and then a tropical storm, and then a hurricane. And then there are different levels of the hurricane. So you have categories one, two, five. All right, so they are generated over warm ocean water at low altitudes, and then, of course, as they go along, they can leave a path of destruction. And don't we know that all too well? Winds exceeding 64 knots, heavy rainfall, storm surges, these are the common things that we see when we talk about a hurricane occurring in the Caribbean. All right, so there we have it. This is how a hurricane looks. Now, we know, we know of some examples of devastating hurricanes that have taken place in the Caribbean, right? And the most famous, perhaps, for us in Jamaica is Gilbert, 1988. I was a teeny tiny baby, I don't recall. And then you have Ivan, 2004. Many persons would recall Ivan because Ivan is in very near memory. I recall Ivan very, very well. And there was quite a bit of destruction for Ivan. Katrina, we know that Katrina left a very devastating path, going all the way up into Louisiana and so on. Dennis, no, Dennis, I recall. I definitely recall Dennis. And I'm not telling you why I recall Dennis. Also, Dean. Daniel, and we've had much more recent ones because every hurricane season we have been having these. And this particular hurricane season that we're just coming out of, because it goes to November 30, so we're coming out of. And this particular season is the most active to date, the most active hurricane season. And every year we keep saying that the season is becoming more and more active. Why? Because of global warming. Climate change is causing a number of these things. We have some disaster statistics here. And if you notice, Haiti's statistics, because for some reason or the other, there have been a number of um, disasters that have taken place with Haiti. Hurricanes, earthquakes, and so on. All right, And this is over a period of about five years or so. All right. 
So let's get to the heart of the question now. The question asks us to talk about mitigation strategies. When we, when we talk about mitigation, what do we mean? We are talking about measures to prevent or minimize death and destruction through anticipation and the successful implementation of these strategies. And mitigation is taking place before and during and even afterwards. For example, with an earthquake, because there are aftershocks and there's the possibility of a tsunami and so you have to continue the work even after an earthquake occurs. So mitigation is in all of those stages. But there are different levels of mitigation. We do mitigation on an individual community, national and regional level. So in your essay, you need to make this clear. When you're writing that thesis statement and when you're, you're making, you're, you're giving your ideas for these mitigation strategies, this is what you're going to use. And what you can do is you can actually use these levels, these markers to form your paragraphs. So after you've given your thesis statement in your introduction, then you can use these to form your paragraphs. So you discuss the individual level, you discuss the community, you discuss the national and then the regional level. And there you have your essay coming together. All right, so let's get into this now. On an individual level, it means you, in your home, your family, what is it that you do? And remember, we have looked at earthquakes, volcanoes, tsunamis, and hurricanes. So all of those are included in this band where we're talking about mitigation strategies. You want to ensure you have an emergency kit in the home, right? Med medication, if you have elderly people or people with any other kind of diseases, you know, you want to ensure you have all of that. Um, Band-aids, anything that um, is important for you just in case somebody gets hurt, you need to have that emergency kit. You need to have an evacuation route or plan. So you and your family need to get together and do some drilling. So if an earthquake should occur, what is it that everybody should do? From the youngest child in the home, what should everybody do, right? So this is something that you need to discuss as a family. You need to know what it is that you're supposed to do. The reinforcement of the infrastructure. And many times we hear hurricanes come in and see everybody up on the roof knock, knocking with their hammer and getting hurricane straps and all kinds of things. Reinforcing the infrastructure just in case something terrible really happens, right? And you want to get insurance too. You know, you want to insure your place just in case anything happens. You have some money to, fa to fall back on in order to help you to recover. I remember very clearly that in what was it, Dean? There was a total destruction of my house. We didn't have any insurance, so you know what happened right there. And so, of course, I determined that should not happen again. You know, and then you want to secure personal belongings, your passport and your birth certificate and all of these things. You want to put them together in a, in, in a bag or a container that, you know, it's not porous and ensure that they are safe. Right? And in Jamaica, we say, you know, take care of your surfy ticket. Make sure you find your surfy ticket. So these are the things you want to do on an individual level. So you discuss these things in your essay. All right, we have to move swiftly along, you know. Now, in, on the community level, communities should come together, designate and organize a shelter just in case something goes wrong. Right? Where is it that people can go? Is it the community center? Is there a church? Is there a school? These are the things that you want to make sure that the community knows. Identify the flood prone areas and begin to look out for the people, especially elderly people or people in wheelchairs who are not able to move, you know, um, people with a disability. You want to take care of those people and you want to look out for those people in the community. And you can probably form your own local community disaster management team, right? Work alongside the local government, the parish council, in order to execute on a community level. All right. So there we have it now, the Caribbean governments. This is the part we want to get to, you know. Because when you talk about mitigation on a national level, you're talking about the government. The government needs to have a plan in place. So the government needs to be proactive. One word sums that up. Proactivity. 
We already know that we are mainly islands in the Caribbean. We already know that we are prone to hurricanes at a specific time. So you cannot sit down and wait until you hear say one hurricane will come. And then all of a sudden everybody's scrambling around, which is what we normally do, right, in Jamaica. So the legalities must be in place. Right? The laws that must be in place for building and settlement restrictions. And so many times we see people living on the gully bank or certain areas and we know that when something happens, they are going to, there's going to be a lot of destruction. See, the other day in, um, in a part of St. Andrew, landslides, severe landslides. And it, it had a lot to do with where people built their houses in areas that were falling down. Those were not places to build houses in the first place. And then you come to the social issues and people will say, people don't have any choice, you know. But the, the government must be proactive in ensuring that people don't build in certain areas. National Disaster Preparedness Plan, we need to have a plan. There must be a plan in place. So in case of anything, this is what will happen. These are the groups that will roll out. These are the things that will now come into effect. The establishment of National Disaster Management Agencies. Right? So you need to have these agencies that are responsible for this thing. And they are the ones who take the forefront. Right? NGOs included too. Education and re-socialization of people. Re-socialization. So important. Because in Jamaica we have a style, you know. When we hear the hurricane I come, no hurricane now come no way. No hurricane now come no way. Me see, I yes, me born and grow me now move from yes you know, and this is the kind of attitude that we have. And we continue, we stay there. And then now when the hurricane come, we up on top of the house. And we wait for helicopter to come, we come carry we out. When we should have moved. Because, you know, the disaster is real. And we, sometimes we don't take it serious. But sometimes we do. And you go to the supermarket and you cannot get no mackerel and no sardine. Because everybody, <laughs> we are stocking up on these things. You know? We must have a disaster budget. Because we know the thing go, we know the thing set. You must have a disaster budget. All Caribbean governments must. And so we have some examples here of, of um, Caribbean disaster management agencies in the individual countries, right? So in, in, in Trinidad, this is the Office of Disaster Preparedness and Management, very similar to Jamaica's ODPM. And we have TEMA, Tobago Emergency Management Agency. So we do have Caribbean countries who have these things in place. But now on a Caribbean regional level, because this is another level of the discussion that you need to write in your essay, you know. You have to talk about the Caribbean region and how it is that, as a region, we handle disasters, right? So we have SIDEMA, which is the agency that is at the forefront, the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency, all right? And this agency is responsible for, for, for working together with Caribbean countries. And when it is that we have disasters of mammoth proportions, such as what took place last year and the year before in some smaller Caribbean islands with Matthew, I think it was, that was one of them. And there were a number of them that had a series of like three, one behind the other. And so the Sidema now comes in to ensure that as a Caribbean, we take care of each other. We help each other to manage how we deal with disasters. And coming out of Sidema, I came across the Caribbean Risk Information System. And this comes out of Sidema. All right. And this is this is a system. This is a platform, a technological platform that they use to manage the system. So information data is placed there. And, and so they use this to inform how they respond in the various Caribbean countries. So very, very important when you are writing that you write about all of these levels and flesh out the information before you go on to your conclusion. Now we have, as I did say to you, different levels of m mitigation. So you have pre, you have during, and you have post. So pre-disaster mitigation. We want to ensure that certain things are in place. And we look at Haiti, for example, in 2010 with that earthquake. Part of the reason why Haiti was so devastated, you know, was because of 
improper building codes or there were none. No standards were there for buildings. And so when the earth shifted and the bottom of the building shifted and then it's coming back into place and the top moves and then the building crumbles because there were no proper standards in place. Now in Jamaica, we have the Bureau of Standards. How many of you students didn't knew that there, there is a certain amount of sand and a certain amount of cement and whatever else they put into that concrete mix? You know, you'd have to ask um, a mason or so. There is a certain amount that you have to put in order to meet the building requirements, even for blocks. So you don't just go anywhere and buy blocks. One little man say, I sell blocks. You need to ask. You need to find out if they're meeting the standards. Because next thing you know, you go and buy blocks, and they're cheap, cheap, cheap. And you build up your house nice, nice, nice. And then when the earthquake comes, it mash it down, down, down. You know? So you want to be careful of what you are doing. And this is what the Bureau of Standards is for. And not just in terms of the mix, you know, but also public buildings, for example, must have certain entrance and exit points. So it cannot be just one, one way to go into the building and one way to come out. If anything should go wrong, what will happen? Everybody rushing to that one exit causes problems, stampede and all kinds of things, right? Gathering areas must be a part of building. So you don't just use up the whole of the land and build up big building and there are no gathering areas just in case. So all of these things must be taken into consideration. And the Bureau of Standards is there to help us to navigate. So that is pre-disaster mitigation. And there are more things we could discuss. Students, do your reading. All right. And then we go to during a disaster. During a disaster, communication is crucial. It's important that the government and the agencies are able to reach to the people. Very important. So at this point, you have the councillors and the MPs on the ground and their workers on the ground, ensuring that you can get to persons. All right? Rescue teams are mobilized. So the army and the fire department and other NGOs like Red Cross and so on are on the alert. International relief, too, comes in right there sometimes. And we go back to Haiti as an example in 2010. Now, with that devastation there in Haiti, they needed water, foodstuffs, drinking water, that is, blankets, clothing, you name it, they needed it. And so you had the Salvation Army, Red Cross, the U.S. and Caribbean governments sending our own people there to assist, to help during the disaster because it was still going on. It was still happening. All right. There were people were displaced and, and everything. So the, not because the earthquake has occurred and it's finished means that the disaster is over. No, the disaster is still going on because the people are feeling the effects of it right now. Right. So as long as that is happening, the disaster is still on. All right. So that's during a disaster. Post disaster. Look at what's happening here in these peaks. We have down power lines. We have the Every, everything here is a mashup, you know. It just mash up. All of the houses mash up. And then over here now, flooding. So these are three different things that, that, that are happening there uh, post-disaster. So you want to ensure that you have the communication up as quick as possible. You want the, the utilities back up, the water and the light and so on, so people can talk to people. You want protection of the citizens, you know. Hmm. Uno see me dish, uno see me dish, anybody uno see me satellite dish. Anybody know that song from Gilbert? Love in there, don't quite know if love in there did really have a satellite dish, you know. Me have a feeling saying so never really have any. But this is what we're talking about. Looting. People are taking over people's things and, 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 and tearing down shops and supermarkets and so on. These are the things that take place. So you want to ensure the police and other uh, protection People, agencies are out there working. You want capital injection for the recovery? Money, because the people them also mash up and they need help. So you need capital injection from the government, right? And of course, you need the immediate things, the water and the food and the education and these kinds of things. You do need those post-disaster. All right, we have a very, very short time period left. And we have looked at that particular question. So all you need to do now is write your conclusion because you would have covered all of the things that are related to disaster mitigation by looking at it in that way. And I caution you again, 
don't just lump up everything into one student when you are writing and just write as you feel in mind. No, strategize and begin to separate what you are going to do to form your paragraphs and then of course you conclude. So let us conclude that and let us look at coral reefs now. This picture you're looking at is the barrier reef in, of the coast of Belize, one of the second largest barrier reef in the world. And we are discussing the importance of coral reefs to Caribbean society and culture. And this question, 30 marks or maybe 20 marks, what are corals and what are coral reefs? Tiny marine creatures are corals that secrete calcium carbonate, which is limestone, and around their bodies. And then after a while, all of these cemented together are what form coral reefs. But coral reefs are not just more than that. They are ecosystems that are formed from the growth of these same coral polyps in the one area, usually along the shorelines of Caribbean countries, right? And so all of that put together over time becomes the coral reef. So why, why is it so important? Why is it so important that we look at this? And I mentioned the barrier reef of Belize. That's the only barrier reef we have. And there are three different types of reefs. You have fringing reefs. Most Caribbean islands have fringing reefs. We have those. All right. And then you have atolls. We don't, we don't have a lot of those, but maybe one or two in the Caribbean. And the fringing reefs are this kind of reef that, that, that grows along the coastline. Right? And you'll see them jutting out from the coast all the way out into the sea sometimes. Where I am from in St. Mary, this is very, very obvious. All right? So the coral reefs, very, very important. Why? Because of coastal protection, they provide protection from waves, high waves as the waves beat in. Right? The coral reefs protect the shoreline. Tourist activities. Yes, we, use it. We, use, we do snorkeling, go on glass bottom boat, and we see the various um, flora and fauna that are formed from this ecosystem that is the coral reef. Growth of mangroves and wetlands, and this is important for the production of fish and other marine life, right? And so we need coral reefs. Now, what are the threats to coral reefs that we have in the Caribbean? We have natural threats and we have those made by humans. And the ones by humans, as you rightly guessed, these are the ones that give the most problem, right? So the natural threats, hurricanes, when, they, when you know, the storm surges and the, the, the excess rain beating on the reefs can damage the reefs. Earthquakes too, volcanoes, tsunamis, all of those can affect the reef. All right? The Saharan dust in the dry season that comes off Africa um, it, and, and that travels through. This year we had a very, very, um, one of those difficult areas of Saharan dust. We, have a, we had a lot of it. It can also damage the, the coral reefs, right? And global warming also does that. Human activity though, tourism, all right? So we, we, we depend a lot on our traditional type of tourism, the, you know, the, the sun and the sand and that kind of thing. And people come to the Caribbean for that. And tourism is a huge selling point for most Caribbean countries. And so we over tourism, if there is such a word. All right? And we break the coral off to, to sell as trinkets and we paint them and all that kind of thing. Fishing practices. Very bad fishing practices, overfishing, dynamite fishing, spear fishing, and you know, that kind of thing. Industrial wastes, chemicals from factories, and all of those are threats to coral reefs. All right, so there we have the spear fishing and so on. All right, and when we look at an essay related to coral reefs and we talk about those things, we want to ensure that we are using point when we are writing our essays. We are making the point. We are explaining. No, I, didn't have a, I don't have a lot of time to do a lot of explanation today, but you should do your reading and be able to explain. All right? Example, give your examples from various Caribbean countries and you make your link back to what it is saying. All right? So 
you know, I do hope that you learned something today. Students, you need to go and do your own reading because that is all we were able to cover. So we've come to the end of our classes. Thank you for participating in the discussion. For a repeat of all three sessions, tune in later to JNN at 4 p.m. or you can subscribe to onespotmedia.com to catch up on all you have missed. Class time continues tomorrow with CSEC POB and Geography and Cape Biology. Until then, keep safe, take care. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here.